What's going on, everybody? Happy March. Welcome back to another episode of the Make Money and Have Fun show. So for those of you that have been paying attention, you'll know that I just wrapped up February, which was author month. But I kind of wanted to do a little bit of a grand finale, talk a little bit more about book writing. I actually even titled today's episode, Make Your Book a bestseller. So I'm talking to a good friend of mine today. He's a publisher. He's an author. He's a speaker. He probably does all kinds of other cool stuff too that he's going to tell you all about. But I'm excited to talk to Tyler Wagner today. So let's get into it. My motto in life is make money and have fun. I'm on a mission to show everyone how to make money yeah, and have fun. I'm all about making money and having fun. I don't know about you, but every time I listen to that song, I still like get goosebumps and just want to start dancing and rocking out and stuff like that. Half the time when I'm in my car, don't don't tell anybody that I do this, but sometimes when I'm in my car, I'll actually just go onto my YouTube channel and I'll find the full theme song and I'll just play it on repeat in my car. And I'm like, I am such a cool person. Anyway, on this note, I got to introduce you to today's guest. He's a good friend of mine. He's a publisher, author, speaker, Mr. Tyler Wagner. What's up, Tyler? Yeah. Dude, that, that intro is awesome, and that uh, music definitely is the vibe. So I, I don't know how, because I've watched your um, I've watched some of your interviews, and I haven't seen that part before. So I was like backstage, like, this is awesome, dude. Right, <laughs> right. Really cool. it's, it's funny because on, on my screen, I have like these little TV screens down at the bottom. So when, mm -hmm. I, when I bring my guest off the screen, I can still see you down there, and half the time my guests like start oh, yeah. rocking <laughs> out, and I keep rocking out. <laughs> I didn't uh, know you could watch TV, so that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, I have like two little screens at the bottom. I got, I have a whole different toolbar here. I have all kinds of cool stuff. I can like bring stuff up on screen. I can do all kinds of fun stuff with this, <laughs> this software. I know, I, I actually can. You got to like, you point at the logo here. I'll make a different logo. There's one. I'll make, uh, I can do okay. a, um, what else can I do? Oh, I can change good. the way our names look down here. There we go. <laughs> yeah, everything's backwards. Yeah, yeah, I'm like trying to get it, and I can't. I can't. Oh, that was the worst. Oh, I can do these too. So like, I can make a little ticker. So if you haven't yet, like, comment, subscribe, and share all that Let's fun stuff. I can bring like, uh, like these are some old stuff from uh, from some of the other shows. But like, if you say something profound, I'll do like something like that where I can bring it up on screen. So we got all kinds of cool software going on here, man. But dude, so tell awesome. me about you, man. What is going on in the world of Tyler Wagner? Just, uh, you know, down here in Miami, having a good time and uh, working, podcasting. Um, what else, man? I mean, that, yeah, that, I think that covers it pretty much. <laughs> you live in the life. Every, every time I text you, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm at some rooftop party or I'm out on a yacht somewhere. <laughs> or like, you're always doing something. Well, cool. In Miami, it's not too, I mean, it, that's all around you, right? So you have to. You kind of have to be walking blind to not run into this. Thing, right? <laughs> uh, that's funny. That's funny. So, dude, tell us your story, man. I mean, you and I have, have chatted a little bit. We hung out. But tell us kind of who you are, what you do, and, and just give us the background on, on Tyler Wagner. Yeah, yeah. So I um, – for sure. So I think it kind of the, – the best place to start is probably when I was around 1920. So – um, or, or right before there, I was in college and I read the four hour work week. We said we would dive into the four hour work week. I'm doing it a little early. Um, I read the four hour work okay, week. Okay. And it, yeah. <laughs> and it, uh, it completely just changed. What, what I tell people is it like equipped me with the mindset to feel comfortable with making the decision of dropping out. And, and one of the things in the book that he talks about is like this exercise of, really figuring out when you're taking a risk, like what is the worst that can happen and really like analyzing that instead of allowing your imagination to go places way further than is actually true. And, and I'll give you the exact example. Um, you know, dropping out of school to a lot of people seems like very risky and like a huge decision and um, just, it almost feels like life and death or something. Like it's just a crazy big decision. But when you boil it down, at least for me, like my, my like um, worst case scenario of dropping out was that I would just end up back at my parents, um, which, you know, luckily they happen to have a pretty nice house, a pool in the backyard. Like my, my worst case scenario wasn't that bad. So I was like, okay, 
I don't see the risk anymore. I was in my head. So then I drop out. And then um, like six months later, I write a book called Conference Crushing. It was about how to network at uh, conferences and like build relationships. And it ends up becoming an Amazon bestseller. And then this was, I'm 29 now, so this is like uh, nine years ago. And nine years ago, like Facebook organically, like your reach went way further um, than it does now. So, you know, I, I posted about the book. I would literally get like hundreds and hundreds of comments and messages. And these, a lot of them were either showing support or people were asking me like, how did I do it? How did I write the book, publish the book, market the book? And, you know, really I think kind of the main reason for that was, is I kind of come from a small town, um, an hour North of Philadelphia near where um, you're, you're at. And, um, you know, people in my hometown, people had heard cause I told them I was dropping out of school. So if I had to guess, I think some people maybe thought I was like going down a bad path. And then like six months later, they wake up and look at Facebook and I'm a best selling author. So it was just like pretty dramatic um, change. And then from there, I just, you know, I helped a few friends for free, um, helped them write, publish, market their books. They got very similar results to me. And now, you know, nine years later, we're talking, we're working together. And um, yeah, it's just been, you know, I kind of fell into it, honestly, into the book publishing, book marketing uh, business, but I'm, I'm very grateful that I did. And then I guess last thing is I have a podcast too, which I absolutely love. So I, I, I love doing interviews. Yeah. I, I saw your, your studio out there. You seem like you got a, you got a pretty, pretty legit setup going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we literally, one of my buddies, it was perfect timing. He, he lives up in, uh, in Canada he um he had just finished building like a, a studio based on all the equipment that Joe Rogan uses. So he actually like built out a blog post with all the equipment, and it was like right when I was gonna like start to figure out like how to build it. So I got hooked up, and basically we mimicked uh, Rogan's studio uh, down here. It's a good person to mimic. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm on my way up. <laughs> He's doing okay in the space. I, I, I just I got one little rinky microphone here that's that's kind of doing its thing. Oh, I just ripped it out. Hold on. All right, there we go. There we go. This is the fun of doing these shows live. Is I, know, I, I love it, man. Raw. That's how it's got to be. That's exactly. you know, when I interview people and like they they'll ask me to like edit some stuff out. I'm like, do you really want me to edit? And I'm not hating. I'm just saying, like, I yeah. think it's cool to have the mess ups. Like that's I think that makes it real. So yeah. It keeps a level of authenticity. Me, I don't edit anything. Like if you listen to my podcast, like if you subscribe to it and just listen to it, like in the car, you'll hear yeah. me like screw up. Like I bump into the microphone and all kinds of stuff. Like yeah. I don't edit anything. I just take this footage and blast it out. <laughs> That's the way. To, and think about like Rogan, you know, he obviously sometimes, I guess, you know, very, very famous people. Like sometimes they maybe say something they didn't need to say. Or, so maybe, you know, you edit it out. But for the most part, it's like just very improv. And like, you know, things happen, like they'll, they'll be drinking something, they'll knock it, like just stuff out. And I, I feel like that's, it just feels more like you're involved in the conversation rather if it's like really clean cut. So yeah. That's the yeah. way I, I've always, I've always subscribed to like more authentic and, and kind of vulnerable pieces of content than like real professional, like structured. Yeah. yeah. This doesn't feel as real. Like, like you said, it feels like you're watching like someone try to make a Hollywood production, but they're not Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's, it's so one of the things um, it might be like helpful to share for the audience that's that I learned from Gary Vaynerchuk is the difference between like documenting and creating. And I think that's one of the reasons that people um, kind of like halt themselves from producing content online is, is they're so focused on creating that they, they forget that you can also document, right? Like you can just share the ups and downs of your day. And, you know, people like to see behind the scenes and like the rawness of you as an individual. So um, just kind of think about that if you haven't posted in a while or you're nervous about it, just documenting your life in general um, it is a post and there, there's not really that much thought that has to go into that. Exactly. Exactly. So this is cool. I, I love these kinds of stories because I I always resonate with the person who I guess didn't really fit in in school or dropped out of school or, or kind of had a little bit of, a, of an awkwardness to school, yeah. which is which is kind of where, where I came from and where I started. It's actually funny. I'm actually editing my third book right now. And my first chapter yeah. is all about that. It's about, you know, fitting in in the society, traditional versus abnormal and, and that whole thing. 
So after you dropped out, what was it that made you get into books and, and book writing and all that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. I left that out. Um, good call on that. <laughs> um, so what happened was I've always been, ever since I was younger, I was just, I've always been a very outgoing person. It was just always the, the guy in school that was like friends with everybody and just, you know, just, I love connecting with people. It's just who I am naturally. So I, um, when I dropped out of school, I was like, I think I want to be a public speaker. Like that was, that was the first thing that came to my mind that I was like, I think I can make good money doing it. I think I enjoy it. I like to travel and I'll be around people all the time. So to me, it just seemed like a, a dream scenario. So, um, and then what happened, I started to go to all these conferences and I started to kind of recognize a theme. All of the public speakers that were getting paid and like were, were speaking at these events, um, they were pretty much all authors, like all the time. And, and most of them were like best selling authors on various lists, like New York Times, Wall Street, Amazon, whatever it might be. And then it just kind of clicked for me. I was like, if I want to, if I want to be taken seriously, uh, the root word of, of authority is author. One of my mentors had told me that too. But if I want to be taken seriously as like a 20 year old dropout, which at the time I was also 80 grand in debt, like there, there was really no reason to pay me to speak in front of your crowd. I, I always make the joke, like you, you'd be better off like paying me not to speak in, in, in front of you. <laughs> like, like, thank you for buying the ticket. Here's your money plus some, now leave us. <laughs> because I just, you know, I didn't have any, I would say any expertise at that time, or I didn't feel like it. Um, but either way, after going to like, it, it honestly had to have been hundreds. Like I went to so many conferences. What I did start to realize is that, and again, it, I think it's just natural for me is I was leaving these events, like feeling like I'd really like made a big step in my life, business, whatever it might be. And I would notice that a lot of times people would leave the events and they didn't really feel it was worth the price of the ticket. And, and I think the reason for that is because they were so focused on the content at the event and not actually building uh, meaningful relationships at the event, which is which was way more my focus. Like I never really even thought about – it's funny. I never really thought about the content. Like any conference I ever chose to go to, it was always based on the speakers and like people I thought would maybe be in the audience, but not the content. So either way, I was getting massive value and I was like, okay, I feel kind of like an expert in this. Let me dive deeper and like research and stuff. And then I built a book that basically is like 17 principles on how to maximize your ROI at a conference and then published it. It hits bestseller. And then it literally, it sounds kind of like magic, but it did work. I started to get paid to speak. Um, it's just in all reality, what took off way quicker was helping people with books. So I kind of, I, I just geared my focus more towards that basically. Interesting. It's interesting. So I think I've mentioned this to you before since you brought up speaking. It warrants yeah. saying again, but I've kind of, I, I like to look at my life as if I ha saying like, I like to call it like catalyst moments that I've had in my life. These, these paradigm shifts, these turning points, these, these breakthroughs where I kind of had like this big aha and it kind of changed the whole trajectory of my life. So when you and I first spoke, I was in a, I was in kind of a, a place where I didn't know where I wanted to do. I had come off of real estate investing, which I had burned down all around me basically. And, uh, you know, watch that crash and burn. And I was anticipating getting back into it as I built it back up. But I realized like yourself, I, I really, I love speaking. I love being in front of audiences. I love being in front of this computer monitor right now. And I really liked teaching financial literacy and real estate a lot better. And when I, when I spoke to you this one time on the phone, I forget what we were talking about, but you mentioned speaking fees. And I'm like, yeah. wait a minute. People get paid to speak because I always had it backwards in my head. I always thought that you had to do something incredible with your life and then you volunteer to speak about it. And that thing that you did is what's funding you. So like my thinking was, oh, I'll get a, hundred, like a whole bunch of properties and then that'll pay for me to go on stages you know, my, my rent checks will cover the fee of me going on stages. But wow, yeah. once, once you just mentioned that one thing, it like flipped the script in my head. And I was like, wait a minute, I can actually build a career as a speaker and a trainer. And I already had two books at that point. And you and I were talking about, you know, helping get yeah. the third one off the ground and that kind of stuff. And that was where like everything shifted. 
But then, awesome. as you and I know, this little thing happened in March of 2020 that oh, told me it, was, it told me it was going to be a little bit more difficult to become a public speaker this year. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, yes, I know the thing you're speaking of. <laughs> the thing that shall not be named. Yeah. So what, what have you kind of seen, I guess, in the in the authoring and the speaking world in terms of where we're at today with the state of affairs? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so conferences have definitely, I think, you know, they've gone down. Um, there's not as many people um, at putting them on and, and there's not as many people that want to go to them, I, I, I don't think, because, you know, of, of the thing we were talking about. But I do think... Uh, and maybe I'm optimistic, but it just seems to me that you can only you can only like stop it for so long. And there's there are people putting on events right now, right? And it, I mean, I believe you know they're wearing a mask and like everything's you know on the up and up, six feet, all that stuff. But um, I just think if I had to guess, by this summer, I feel like things are going to get back to nor normal ish, whatever that means, mm -hmm. on, on events. And the, and the thing that's interesting too is that I've it's it, and I'm in Miami, right? So I'm in like the spot where, uh, depending on where you lean on this, right? <laughs> so it's a little. <laughs> um, We're turning like, this into a political podcast. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I actually don't. Mind. All the Republicans over here, all the Democrats <laughs> over here. <laughs> um, so it's just like you know people hear about Florida and stuff and they're like, Oh, it's, it's as if, you know, it doesn't exist and it's open. It's definitely more open, but I, I do think that I feel like it kind of has to do with the weather, honestly, like, because when I, I went up to visit my parents for uh, Christmas and um, the, the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, he shut everything down for two weeks. And, and, you know, me and my brother, we like to go to the gym and work out. So we were kind of pissed about that, but either way, it was shut down, but it was so cold. I feel like it's easier to shut things down because people don't want to leave their house anyway. Like right now, I'm looking at you can see the the sun uh, hitting my face. Like it is literally 75 and sunny out right now, and it's like that pretty much every day. I hate. I don't. No, I, I'm not saying that to, in a brag. I just mean like I you can't. I don't believe people would accept like lockdown. Like it's too nice out, man. Like there's there's just so I don't know. Um, I, in the right places, Arizona, Florida, I think events are really going to start coming back. And then in the colder places, uh, hopefully in the summer, that starts to open up. And then maybe we'll just go back to normal. But I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there, there's definitely it's, – it's interesting, you know, now that the, the cat's out of the bag in a sense. Uh, yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Every, every winter, I, I take a financial lull. Right. My, my finances dip a little bit every winter. OK, let's talk. OK, go ahead. Talk about <laughs> and, and, it, and it's like I, I don't know exactly why. It, like, for well, for one, I hate the cold personally. Yeah. Like I, I, I am guilty of completely hating the cold in every way. We just got over like a foot of snow over here, which was, you know, loads of fun doing that. <laughs> but if it like if, if it were up to me, I would I would live in Hawaii my whole life. You know, because I just love the heat. I love the weather. I love being out in the sun. I love nature, you know, going out in hikes and, and that kind of stuff. And so whenever whenever winter comes around, I always I always kind of have like the the worst part of my year, in a sense, yeah. in the winter. Like not not to say that things are bad or, or anything like that. It's just that there's always like some kind of little dip financially in the business and the career and stuff like that. And it's like, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm laying in bed longer and I'm not getting, you know, the morning routine done. I'm, I'm staying in my pajamas all day and I'm wearing hats and all bundled yeah. up. You know, it, it could be all of these little things just kind of propagated together that make it into something big at that point. But I'm, I'm with you. I think that, yeah, I think that the world is on its way back to normal. And, and for me, it's, it's just been an adjustment. I'm like, OK, let's put the speaking on hold for a minute. Let's finish the book. You know, let's let's do uh, now I have a mastermind that's going on. I'm like, let's do some training. Let's put some masterminds together. And then, you know, as the summer comes around, I'll probably hit you up and be like, dude, get me on stages. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And I, I mean, look, there's still there's online seminars. Right. But um, again, I think by summer, I think it will. Um, it's just going to be and, and maybe it won't be so normal, you know, like the, the whole the, right. Like if you think about the book that I wrote, like. It's all about connecting with everybody at the conference. If, if you have to be six feet apart, 
that makes it a little more difficult <laughs> to connect. Yeah, that's that's the interesting thing. I also think about it in terms of how can we take an advantage of this? Because I'm always looking at the upside on yeah. it. And like you said, you know, I'm hitting up a lot of virtual conferences. I'm even doing like a like a weekly, I guess you could call it a seminar in a sense, a, a value add where I'm kind of just like, hey, I'm talking about X, Y, and Z. Come hang out. I'm actually doing one tonight at six. So in two hours, an uh, hour and a half, I'm doing a doing one of those. So that'll be that'll awesome. be pretty cool. But yeah, dude, and I for, for me, I think it's open. Like, I've just reached out to even more people online. Like, I've seen some of your uh, episodes of this. Like, you've interviewed some incredible people. Mm -hmm. And, like, one of the things I would just do now, now that, you know, you're, wherever you're at, things are still kind of locked down or, you know, kind of in a gray middle area. Like, use this time to, like, reach out to people. You know, like, I, I reach out to, like, he still hasn't responded. I've reached out to Tony Robbins on Instagram. I'm like, yo, man, want to come on the podcast? You know? <laughs> <laughs> like I, I reached out to Grant Cardone yesterday. Yeah, like why I, I don't understand what people are um, like afraid of with it. Really, it's just a question, and like you might get a yes, you might get a no. Like as you know, um, I, it was kind of it happened in a different way. But I had Gary Vaynerchuk on, and like that. I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. So I had him on. I interviewed this woman, and then she asked me at the end of the interview. She's like. Is who's like your like top person that you'd want to have on your show? And I was like, I'm a Gary Vee guy. So um, she tweeted at him. He responds, and then he's like, Yes, like I like I'll do it. And he tagged his assistant Tyler, same, same name as me, and uh, literally fly out there a couple months later and interview him in his office. And like, I'm just like things like that can happen. That's the point of me sharing that. Is you know, you reach out to Cardone. He, I, I don't know if you actually saw, but he. Um, on his wife's Instagram story, I saw it today. They got stuck in an elevator all day. Oh, wow. So he said he was like responding to DMs today. He he literally said that. So who knows, man? Like literally, maybe. <laughs> like think about the time. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a quick break to message Grant <laughs> and I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, like I think they just got out like an hour ago because I, I I was like watching her story and I was like they are literally stuck. In an That's hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's funny that you bring that up. The the number one question that I get asked about this show is people always ask me about Les Brown. They're like, dude, how did you get yeah. Les Brown to come on your show? Awesome. And I always ask him, I always tell him the same thing that you said. I'm like, dude, I just asked him. <laughs> yeah. It's like I just I just said, Hey Les, I'm doing this show. You want to come on? He's like, Yeah, sure. When do you want me? I'm like, I don't know, how Saturday. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta realize like it's like it's it's just as fun. It, it just really comes down to their to timing, I think, right? So it's like, you know, I, let's just use Grant Cardone as an example. Like at the end of the day, Cart he's always busy if he wants to be busy. But it's also just like it's fun to be interviewed, you know? Like it's fun yeah, to sure. interview. So it's like there's gonna be a day where he like opens it up and he's just like, you know, today my schedule's not as good, or by that time maybe this show will be huge. Like whatever it is, reaching out, there's gonna be, uh, I, I guarantee he'll respond at some point. Like I bet you he will. Oh like, yeah. So I, I reached out to to his assistant and she was like, oh, this process can't be fulfilled right now. And I'm like, what are you a robot? <laughs> so it's, it's always it's always just, I mean. The, the, the funny thing is I, I heard recently this saying that like, what, what would you do if you, you stopped fearing people telling you no? Like what, what would you be capable of at yeah. that point? Cause most people I think stop wow. themselves before they're ready. So, so here's something funny talking about authoring and about books and things like that. So all month I did this little experiment and you're going to love this. Okay. So let's talk to real quick, the, the listener out there who is the person who wants to write a book but never has, and they and they don't know how, right? They're this aspiring author. What kind of advice would you give to that person? It's it, so it actually is in full alignment with what we're already talking about. Is it's it's what I notice with people that want to write a book is they have this mindset that the first draft has to be perfect. So and that's what mm -hmm. inhibits them from actually finishing it because the process is way more artistic in my opinion, meaning like it's, it's messy. Like you have to write your first draft. First draft is probably gonna be like pretty bad and that's okay. <laughs> but like the cool thing is there's these things called editors that will dramatically change your writing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of similar to what we're talking about with this. Like, you know, 
every day, right? Like literally my team and I do it. Like we reach out to dozens for different reasons, business and podcast, dozens for podcasts, hundreds for uh, Authors Unite stuff of people and basically asking them either if they want to come on the show or if they're down to collaborate and potentially do work together um, in the book publishing field. So like, you know, we get a ton of yeses, but if I, if I had to measure it, I mean, it's probably less than 50% are yeses and more are noes, but we do so much like volume and consideration on who we're reaching out to that like, even if it was only a 1% yes rate, which it's, it's definitely higher than that, but let's just say it was 1%, we'd still be doing really well. Right. And that's what I think people need to just really consider that it's um, it's a numbers game. Yeah, it's a numbers game. And it's like people are going to say no. I mean, that's just life. (laughs) Yeah, I I think I mean, I've always been of the mind that when it comes especially when it comes to writing a book, people get in their own way. I think that we make it harder than it is in our head. And oh. I, always, I always talk about my first book, right? I have it right here. So this is the first book I ever wrote. I mean, it's nothing it's nothing crazy. And I, I read it the other day. Dude, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, I opened it up. I'm like, what in the world is going on in this thing? That but is awesome, like, dude. The funny part was I didn't do any of that stuff. I didn't hire an editor. I didn't hire a ghostwriter. I didn't hire a publisher. I, I did it all myself. I mean, I literally just put it, typed it into Microsoft Word, you know, I had a friend of mine, like put the cover together. I sent it into, uh, it was actually create space back then. It wasn't even KDP I at know. the time. I remember. Space. <laughs> right. And, uh, and dude, I mean like literally it was so bad. I couldn't even format the ebook correctly. I spent weeks, like literally like two, three weeks trying to edit the format, the, the ebook. And oh, so you did I, it yourself. Yeah. I was trying to do it myself and I yeah. have, I have infographics in this book. So it's like, they just went like, crazy every time i move something they're like oh da, 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 da. and it's like just like pixels everywhere and i'm like this is great yeah and so finally i just i talked to them on the phone and they're like oh we have a service that does that for 80 bucks i'm like here take my money just get the ebook <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say that's what I, I didn't even try to do it on my own like it i still it's funny i run a publishing company i do not know how to do that <laughs> yeah I have a team that does it. I, I think it's so let me let me ask you this question then i'll kind of give you my opinion what what would you call yourself? Like if people asked you to give yourself a title, what do you say? Uh well, I mean, I, I call myself head honcho. Not 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 to your girlfriends, like to business people. No, that's, <laughs> yeah. no, no, that's that's true. True. If you go to my LinkedIn, it says head honcho at Authors Unite. <laughs> um, so, so like, are you like a publisher, a, a speaker? Yeah. Like honestly, I, I'd say we're more. So we do publish books, but I'd say we're more a book marketing firm. Okay, that, that would make more sense. That we do we do a lot more book marketing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of what what I was thinking. I, um, but yeah, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting model because what what I what I recently realized is that there's like three ways to achieve success in this world. The first way is to work your ass off. The second way is to throw money at it. And the third way is to create strategic partnerships with people, which is, I, I think, where you've kind of thrived. In- exactly. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful. So I'll, I'll, ex- I'll kind of explain that. Yeah. Is, um, this is something, it, it actually me and a member from my team are building a whole separate like business based on this, just because we, we really believe in it so much. And the, and the cool thing about it is like you – you don't really need money to build a business this way. Uh, you definitely need like people skills, if you will, but you don't, you know, you don't need an advertising budget really. You don't need anything like that. So um, th- the way that I built it is when I wrote my first book, what I noticed is that publishers, and I don't mean this in any negative way, it's just, it's not what they do. They, they typically don't market their author's books. You know, they, they publish the book and then it's up to the author to do the marketing. So when I realized that, I was like, okay, well, if I like become an expert on the marketing side, I won't really have any competition. And also what I'll ha- all I'll have to do is build meaningful relationships with uh, publishers, ghostwriters, editors, PR agencies, anybody who works with a big pool of authors, they, they have an opportunity to refer to us and we might be able to refer to them. Um, like, as you know, like there's, even though we publish books, if somebody comes to us and I feel another publisher would be better for them, I will just refer them to that publisher. 
Um, and literally we are at a point now, I mean, we've been at this for almost 10 years. It's like nine years and some change um, that we have in our database over 3000 partners that either I've talked to or somebody from our sales team that we've literally had a conversation with and not all of them have referred to us, but actually more than 50% have. And it's just crazy. Like I wake up every day with referrals. So I just think it's a very, very good strategy that any business, if we want to go to like, um, even a plumber, right? So, so, um, let's actually talk about that. So a plumber or like a landscaper works too. I've said this on uh, me and Jay Duran, who, you know, we were talking on my podcast a couple weeks ago and I was like, look, I think this strategy works for every, like any single person. It, all they need is LinkedIn and, and Google, because if let's just say I was a landscaper, what I would do is I would go to LinkedIn and I would find real estate agents in my local um, area, like maybe the closest five zip codes. And I would be like, hey, every time you sell a home, let them know about me that I, you know, I'm the local landscaper. I'll give you 20% commission on every deal that comes from you. And you will literally create yourself like an army of real estate agents that promote you to all of their um, clients, you know, and then you'll just, <laughs> you'll just crush it. And I don't think many, I just don't think people think that way. Like from, yeah, I don't know. I, I just think it would work for anybody. Yeah, it's it's really a, a genius way of thinking. I mean, that that was another another kind of slap in the face that I had recently. Actually, I had it exactly nine weeks ago. So nine weeks ago is when I, I like inaugurated, like started my mastermind. And yeah. I, I brought people in. And I'm like, look, I'm I'm in this position right now where I'm kind of I'm kind of tight on funds, and I can't really I can't really build the business using money. And and it's like I don't really have enough income to to warrant like going balls to the wall into this thing. What yeah. can I do? And, and another friend of mine has a similar business model to yours, where he's he, it's actually really interesting. What he does is he um he teaches real estate investing, but he brings on other coaches. Yeah, and the other coaches teach these different things. Like one of them teaches NLP, one of them teaches financial literacy, one of them teaches you know X, Y, and Z, and they all take splits on each other. Oh, that's awesome. It's, okay. it's so smart. And he's yeah. like, you need to create strategic partnerships. And that was like another thing where like my mind blew up. I'm like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah. And just to really like harp on it for a second in a good way is like the, it's really limitless, right? So it's like, I, I was at a point and some weeks it still is that way. I've just kind of, uh, I've, I've been able to hire enough people that it's not like that really anymore. But like for years I was doing like 50, literally maybe even sometimes a hundred. I know it sounds crazy, but I was doing like 50, let's just say on average 50 calls per week with potential partners for authors unite. And now I have a full sales team that I basically duplicated myself and they all do that too. So it's just like, like if you go to LinkedIn and type in real estate agent, I, there's millions, it would take you a lifetime to connect with all of them. So you have Google at your disposal where you can reach out to contact forms and people's website, which is literally the reason the contact forms there. People would be surprised to hear like you actually get a lot of responses from when you reach out to somebody's contact form. I think the reason is because most people never do. So when somebody gets like an email and like, Hey, somebody filled out your form. They're like, what the heck? Like so nobody's filled this out in like years. So like you typically get a response and then LinkedIn, um, it's, it's, you know, it's very similar just in, in responses. Like you get a lot of responses. People are on LinkedIn to do business. So, you know, I don't know. It's just every person I've talked to about strategic partnerships, most people in their mind, they just have it like, oh, I'll just have a few referral partners. Like this is my person for this. And, and the way I've always thought about it is like, what if you had a million referral? I know it sounds crazy, but like, what if you had a million referral partners? Like you would, your business would just thrive without you ever having to do yeah. marketing. <laughs> so, you I, would never do anything. Your, your business would take care of itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you need a good product or service and you need partners. That's it. <laughs> There's nothing else. It, it's really, it's a smart, it's a very strategic and, and smart way, I think, to operate. And, and the other thing is this. You ain't selling low ticket products. <laughs> no, you know no, what I mean? no. like, so, so it's like, you know, it's 
it, it, it works either in on either side. You know, it works for somebody who's selling, you know, one dollar bracelets and it works for somebody who's selling, you know, cars, houses, whatever. You know, it, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter. Just no, because the, so, the model is Yeah. So I just for yeah. the bracelet example, because I, I love just saying it because like it's just so so the, if, if I was selling bracelets, what I would do is find people maybe that sell clothing, right? Like, or, and it's like a sim, it's a complementary product, but it doesn't compete directly. And like, you know, maybe there's a chance for you to promote your bracelets to their jewelry list or their um, uh, clothing list and then vice versa. And, you know, all, all you'd have to do is like, again, LinkedIn or Google and just type in like clothing company. I don't know. Like, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's complimentary anywhere. The, the plumber could reach out to electricians and say, Hey, anytime yeah. I, I got a, I got a whole house to do, I'll bring you along with me, you know, or, or whatever or contractors or carpenters or, or, you know, it's the list goes on and on. And then you become like the source. That's the thing, you know? And then you're like, the, you're like the guy because eventually what happens is like, you know, this is assuming you do very good work, right? Because right. any business that's going to do well, you know, you have to have a good product. But eventually, like the landscaper or the plumber, or the electrician, like you will become kind of the talk of the town because everybody's referring to you. Like I tell this quick, uh, it's, it's short. Basically, there was one time, um, Fred, that I had, I, I believe it was six. I had six different people in the same week refer me the same person to do book marketing. Like that person became a client. Like very easily <laughs> you know so like once you build up yeah. enough of these partnerships you literally will start to have scenarios where you get like six referrals to the same and that person by the time they're on the phone with you they're like dude everybody refers you like yeah they, they think you're god already at that yeah, point. They're like, it's not even a sale that's the big, biggest point too say say you're like not good at sales I don't even think I, I don't think I'm good at sales, honestly. Like I just have built the business in a way that like, you know, it's a referral. So it's already trust. Trust has already been built. Yeah. So I just get on the call and I'm just like, hey, like, tell me what you're looking for. If we can fulfill that, then let's work together, you know? And it's more of like a get to know each other call. It's not exactly. a I don't know. Those are those are easier. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely third party edification is is enormous. I, I think that people totally underestimate it in so many ways. And Russell Brunson talked about it in Dot Com Secrets. Okay. He, he, was, he was like, oh, I'm, I'm doing all these conferences, and and some of the time I'm close. I have a 50 percent closing ratio, and the other other time I have 20 percent closing ratio. And I tweaked all this stuff, and I tried to figure out what it was, and I finally figured out that it was the MC. H however good the MC announced me. Wow determined like like x amount of percentage of how well i do with the sales in the back of the room wow. that makes yeah. complete sense That's right yep. and, and he's like he's like ever since then i, I give mcs flashcards now and i'm like just just literally read this exactly as it's written on the flashcard. <laughs> and like that, that's a hard thing to tell an MC because they're they're like, you know, aspiring speakers, you know, so, so yeah. they like want to improvise and make it this. He's like, don't change it. Just read it off the flashcard. I, I wonder, I heard he did really well at 10X Growth Con, whichever won the last, maybe it was number three that uh, yeah. he spoke at. So I don't, I wonder how that went if Grant Cardo was just like, yeah, I'll just do what you say. Or Cardo was like, nah, man, I'm just going to do what I want. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've never been to a 10X. But, dude, speaking of that, I got to bring this up again. So on LinkedIn, he just posted. He's like, oh, one of the best moments of my life was speaking at 10X. And um, he said, like, what are what are some of your speaking goals? Right? It was like his question on his post. And so I wrote in there, I'm like, I would love to have Russell Brunson and Grant Cardone on my show. <laughs> there you go. See, and there's so many ways. And, like, I, I do. I just think there's so many ways to get their attention. Um, like with Gary V, dude, there was people that like did like a, a lot of like spoofs on Gary in, in like a funny way, you know. And like sometimes he would like it would come across his desk, and then he'd comment, and you know, there you go. Like you, so, there's just so many ways to get in front of people, man. Like you, you can do it if you really want. It. We're, we're we're so connected. I mean, you can yeah. you can reach anybody today. That's that's the craziest like weirdest thing. Like. For, for me, it's it's been like kind of arm's length stuff. Like, like for instance, I'd be like, oh, hey, Tyler, you had Gary Vee on your show. Can you hook a brother up? Like like something yeah. like that where it's like 
this like one hand washes the other. But now I'm just like, you know what? Let me try something. I'm just going direct to the source. And it's, you know. No, I guarantee if you reach out to 20 people a day on Instagram, and these could be like, you know, people with millions of followers, the blue check, whatever, all that stuff. I get one out of 20 are going to respond. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean, man. How many I mean, other people are you going to interview? That's one interview a day for you. I mean, that, there you yeah, go. exactly. I, I would have a problem if all 20 said yes. I'd be yeah, like, oh, yeah, man, yeah. I got I to charge for the show. That's a good problem to have then. That, that, that we're in business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's sure. just, I mean, I, I love the growth process of it. I love looking at this show and it's like, wow, I have a background now. Wow, I have, you know, all these different, you know, distribution platforms and just like seeing <laughs> how it grows for, for me, that's the most fun part. I was actually going to add like your, this, I think it's called vid or stream yard. Like yeah. it's, it's pretty cool what it does. I know I'm going to be nice and tan after uh, this. <laughs> Should have got better blinds, but whatever. <laughs> ah, you're good. I got, I actually got two lights on. You can't see them, but they're like, oh, right right. Next to me and, and they're yeah, like, no, you're just looking real, real nice. <laughs> Dude, it, did, it didn't always look like this. Watch the old episodes. There's like a bookshelf behind me and like a staircase. <laughs> the bookshelf though, that's like a lot of like influencers, the bookshelf. That's yeah, like but mine's not a nice bookshelf. Like this is oh, like a $17 bought it at Target 10 years ago. Okay. You know, kind of mini books. This isn't like the nice like walnut with like the plumber pipe and like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I feel like the bookshelf's just kind of like you know, like I read. You know, <laughs> it's in the back. Man. Yeah, it's like when you can't afford a Lambo, you put a bookshelf in the back. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the bookshelf's classier anyway. So, I'll yeah. Read. What are you gonna do? I think it's the books that are on the bookshelf that matter. Not the book. Uh, yo, that's how you can tell. Yep, for real, dude. Check out those books on there. Next time you see somebody, really like pause, zoom in. What do they got going on? It's like I don't I don't look at, at pretty girls on Instagram. I just look at books, man. I'm like, <laughs> yo, look at this guy's book collection. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've gone through phases with that and all us. I've gone through phases where I've unfollowed like every girl that like I just, you know, that I find attractive. Because <laughs> I'm like, yo, you're taking up a lot of my time, man. Like I'm not, uh, <laughs> and then you don't deserve this. Oh yeah. I'll, I'll slowly start following some back and I'm like, Oh, I'm back in the trap again. <laughs> oh geez. Now just... we're getting out of hand. <laughs> so let's get back to business here and yeah. tell us a little bit about your company. So, so somebody who's, who's new to the, the book writing space, if, if they called you up and, and wanted to hire you, what are some of the things that, that you could do for them? For sure. So we offer a lot of different programs and services, but I guess, our, our nine core um, done for you services, I'll, I'll kind of uh, breeze through them. So the best way I can describe it is we're a done for you book publishing and book marketing service. So if somebody comes to us and they just have a book idea, but they don't want to write it themselves, we have a full ghostwriting team so we can ghostwrite their book, we can edit their book and then publish their book for them and distribute it, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all the stores. And then after that, if somebody you know wants us to market the book for them, um, then we can help them achieve uh, becoming a bestseller, which is you know like what this is called. That ranges anywhere from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Wall Street, USA Today, New York Times. Um, actually, a campaign we did a few weeks ago also hit LA Times and a couple other lists that I, I really wasn't even aware of. So there, there's many lists out there. And then after that, a lot of our authors are um, not nonfiction mostly. So they have a business or, or something on the back end, whether it's public speaking, a course, a mastermind. Um, and that's where with this um, uh, strategic partnership that I was telling you about, we've kind of built or we're in the process, but we're getting close of like building a program to like really help the, the author build their business after. Right. So it's kind of like now you have your book. You have the bestseller accolade. The brand is built. Now let's like really go out there and like grow your business and start to really um, get some numbers on the board. So that's kind of the three prong process there. Yeah, it's it's interesting because every, every time I talk to you, they're, you're just like giving me new services. You're like, oh, I can do that. I can do that. I oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we could like media and because I'm. That's the thing. Like I was kind of saying with like becoming the source. So it's like I have. I don't know the exact, I think it's over 300 of, of our partners are, are PR agencies. So like when people reach out, they're like, hey, I want to be featured here, here, and here. Like 
the chances are I can probably make it happen just because like I'm so well connected in that world. So literally that's a service we offer. If somebody wants to be featured somewhere, I just literally, I'm like, Hey, where do you want to be featured? And I reach out to my PR partners. They, they tell me yay or nay out of 300 plus, you know, chances of getting at least one yay is, is pretty high. And then I'll just connect them. And then, you know, the deal is made. So it's, um, you become really resourceful too, when you build a business in this way, because you just become so well connected that even if I can't solve your problem, like the chance of me knowing somebody that can is like really high. Um, exactly. Yeah. That's what I always used to say to like coaching clients and to people in my mastermind is like, look, I, I might not know the answer, but I probably know where to find it. Yes. And, and like, and that makes you resourceful too. Cause I talk to other coaches and coaches get discouraged a lot of times when they're like, Oh, I feel like I can't serve everybody because I, I don't know X, Y, and Z. And I'm yeah. like, look, I think that not knowing something makes you more valuable as a coach because mm -hmm. it, it lets them know that you're real. It lets them know that you're not, you know, blowing smoke and yeah. it lets them know that, you know, you, you have your area of expertise and then you have your area of, of not expertise. A hundred percent. And, and so I always tell people that same thing. I'm like, tell them, look, I don't, I don't know the answer to your question, but I can probably find it out for you. Let me call some yeah. friends. Yeah. You know, yeah, back to you. <laughs> yeah like, no, definitely. And that's, I don't know. That's the beauty of it. We've never lived in a, in a time like this. We're literally connecting with people. Like imagine like back in the day, like if you wanted to talk to somebody in a different state, like you had to get on like your horse. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, dude, shit would have been harder than, excuse my yeah. life. That would have no. been way more difficult. Yeah, I get it. Like you, you got no GPS. You got to find your way there. Yeah, you know, you're, hey, you're we're exposed. talking about laying in bed on Instagram and DMing. Like, come on, guys, <laughs> you can do that. I love that. I love it, yeah. dude. It's 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 so cool looking at basically just just what you've created because it's like like you said, it's so it's so necessary in the marketplace. You yeah, know, I feel like there's there's so many aspects to to writing a book and and getting it out there and that kind of stuff. I actually found it, and you'll love this. I found a, a, a big shift in my results when I changed the question slightly. So yeah. for, forever, I was, I was talking to people and I was saying, hey, I want to become a speaker. What should I do? And everybody was referring me to speaker coaches. And they're, and they're talking about like, oh, you know, I'll teach you how to speak on stage and how to anchor it and how to this and that. And I'm like, look, that's not really where I need the most help right now. What I need help with is getting on stages. And then one day I just switched the question. I'm like, you know what? Let me ask a different question. I put a post up on Facebook and I said, instead of, you know, I'm trying to become a speaker, I put, how can I get on more stages? And literally in one day I got four resources to people that all they did was book speakers. Like they don't, do any, they don't do any coaching. They don't do any of that kind of stuff. They're just like, we'll get you booked. Yeah. Okay. I would love to know these people. That's oh, awesome. dude, I, I figured you already knew them. <laughs> I, you know what's funny? I, I, um, <laughs> I probably do honestly, but <laughs> I mean that in the nicest way. Like I yeah. just, it's the chances if, yesterday I was on a call and this guy, um, we were talking about uh, marketing his book <laughs> and he was like, yeah, one of my friends last week just hit the wall street journal. And, uh, and I was like, what's his name? I won't, I won't say, but he said his name and I was like, yeah, that was us. <laughs> <laughs> like what are the chances? But like, you got it. What's funny is you realize like, okay, there's so many real estate agents. There's so many people in industries, but when you build a business this way, it does kind of become a small, smaller world. Yeah. And it's just like when somebody hears your name multiple times from multiple different people, they kind of just like right away. It's just like the guard goes down. There's no more like, they're not skeptical. anymore. there's just, it's just such an easier way of doing things. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I know we're kind of getting close on time here, but I wanted to ask you yeah. to finish up just to kind of hit the, the bestseller title of, the, of this video. What, what does it really mean, I guess, to become a, be a bestseller? Is it, is it all it's really built up to be, or is it kind of more, more mystique that's just like, you know, yeah. nothing behind the curtain? No, no, I'll answer it for you. I mean, I think, so there's a few different ways. So in, in your opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm trying to, because it's all over the place, really. So this is what I'd say. There, there's really five major lists, and I'll, I'll break it all down. So there's five major lists. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, USA Today, Wall Street, and New York Times. Amazon, it is, you're still a best-selling author, but it is categorical, right? So at the end of the day, 
marketers, you know, they, they kind of ruined it because, you know, you could put your book in like the category of like sewing and sell 10 copies and hit bestseller. So, you know, look, however you want to feel about that, it is, it is what it is. It's just the way that the algorithm works right. and it's just kind of the way it is. So, you know, um, Barnes and Noble is a little bit more difficult because it's, it's, it's more of like a whole store bestseller, like a top 10. Um, so that one you typically need to sell at least a few hundred um, in, in a day to hit that. Um, now USA Today, Wall Street, that, that's when we start to get like it, pretty serious because you really need like minimum like 5,000 copies. There's, there's some other strategies to it, but like 5,000 copies in a week. And like truth be told, like even some of the biggest influence, like to sell 5,000 minimum is, is hard. It's hard for anybody. So when you hit USA Today or Wall Street, especially the mainstream media, they know that your book had to have performed really well. So I, I believe that USA Today, Wall Street, those are the ones that really opened doors up for media, public speaking, um, and just various, just as a brand, like it's a whole nother uh, thing. Like if, if you know Chris Voss, he's an FBI negotiator. He wrote Never Split the Difference. He hit Wall Street Journal. It's the first thing on his Instagram, Wall Street Journal bestseller, um, as his titles. And then New York Times, New York. what's interesting about New York Times is it's the only one that really isn't based on sales alone. So it's, it's actually, there's the criteria is like way too long to even explain, but it is, you know, you have to be with a traditional publisher. Uh, the, we did one a, a few weeks ago and our client sold, I think it was 21,000 books. And he hit number eight on the New York Times. So like it's possible. And, and my last point, I just wanted to kind of give an explanation is like, I believe it's how you leverage it, right? So what I, the reason, you know, we do our, our sales calls and, and it's, we, it's more about going over expectations. In all honesty, like we have some people, you know, they pay us, they want to become a bestseller and it's, it's very much an ego thing, right? So they just want to put bestseller and, on their socials and then they don't do anything with it. Oh, that's fine. Like, no, you know, you do what you want to do with it. But if you really want to grow a career and leverage it, I believe it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of the best branding tool ever. And, and a great example of that is Russell Brunson. He literally is the founder or co-founder of a hundred million dollar company. If you go to his LinkedIn, I think it's on his Instagram too. The first thing it says is New York Times bestseller. The second thing it says is co-founder of ClickFunnels. So he literally weighs like New York Times bestseller above like ClickFunnels in a sense, right? As far as a brand goes. Sure. Uh, sure. So uh, yeah, to answer your question, I don't mean to go, it's it just, um, I feel like it really depends on how you leverage it. Like that's what mm -hmm. I'd say. So, you know, when me and you were talking like public speaking, mastermind, like you have a back end infrastructure in mind and you're not afraid to reach out to people, having that bestseller status next to your name I think that's going to get you more DM responses. I think as a brand, it's, it's going to build trust easier. Like my life story is it right? Because I was 20, I was in debt, but I was a best selling author. So people took me seriously in all honesty, maybe even if they shouldn't have, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it, it's a game changer if you use it correctly. Mm -hmm. I totally a hundred percent agree. Cause it's funny for me being in the book writing side of the, of the wall, essentially it's like the, the mystique has kind of gone away for me, especially with Amazon, you know, Amazon's yeah. almost like, like I talked to somebody once he's like, that's like, you know, telling somebody you're going to sell a car, but it doesn't come with brakes. If you're, if you're not <laughs> an Amazon bestseller, like it's like stupid to not be I'm like, you know, that makes so much sense at this point. But like you said, in your eyes, in the eyes of the public and in the eyes, most importantly of event producers, if you're trying to become a speaker, to them, it's like, you know, the Wizard of Oz, like, you, you know, you, you got this whole big thing going on. And, and I, I think that, yeah, absolutely. It, it all comes down to what you end up doing with it. Yeah, 100 percent. Which which really makes total sense. Dude, this has been awesome, man. I know. I'm, I'm so excited having you here. I, I told you I didn't know what we were going to talk about. <laughs> Dude, I, I didn't want to know, man. <laughs> I love so, it. So real quick to wrap us up. How can people get in touch with you? How can they reach out to you? What do they What do they need to know about you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, two two best ways, like Tyler at AuthorsUnite.com. That's my email. Website's AuthorsUnite.com. And then um, 
Instagram uh, DM. That's probably quickest way just to get a, a response. And that's Tyler B. Wagner, middle initial in there, because there's a baseball player, Tyler Wagner, that has all my stuff. So. <laughs> I there hate that, that happens. I hate oh, that. Yeah, man. He's so the what, first on Google too. <laughs> what would you uh what would you like to leave our audience with? Words of wisdom, encouragement, advice, or just anything at all? Yeah. Um all right. So I don't wanna hopefully this doesn't drag out, but I was talking to Jay Duran earlier. Dude, you're today. the one with the time crunch, not me. I, I, know, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know I I do. I have a call off five. <laughs> um so basically I was talking to Jay Duran earlier this morning and like we were just talking about how like if you can like look at all your work as like a piece of art, then it, like your life and your work becomes way more meaningful. And what I was talking about is like, cause I do a podcast as, as, as you know, and I, and I, for the longest time, like I always enjoyed it, but I, I didn't see like, I didn't see how valuable it actually was and like how artistic it was to be able to have like a long form conversation like this, like off the cuff. But now that I see how meaningful and valuable it is to myself, the interviewee and the people listening, I now look at like every interview like this, like a piece of art and like I go all in on it. Like I don't hold anything back. It's, it's pretty much all off the cuff and like I just be as raw and honest as possible. So either way, I just think if you can start to adapt that into all of your working um, tasks, your work becomes way more fun, becomes way more meaningful, which then in the long term, obviously more money, more relationships, whatever you know the end result is. But um, I think it's just a cool mindset shift. Um, instead of being like, I need to do this, be like, dude, I'm interviewing this guy today. And like, this is literally a piece of art that is going to be on the web forever. So I love that. Yeah with that <laughs> that's awesome dude that is yeah. so exciting i love that life everything that we do is a get to not a got to i get to yes brother i love it man this has been awesome thank you man so talk to you again you. soon dude, i want to be on your show next yes we will do it we'll schedule all right sounds like a plan everybody else we'll see you again very soon see you bye. have a good one guys